it's time to enter to the conference. Thank you very much, all of you, for uh, all the warm welcome speeches and the important points that you raised. I wouldn't think a better welcome and a better introduction to this conference. Of course, we have to thank a lot. We have to thank a lot, apart from you from being here and make it a conference, we have to thank our sponsors. We have to thank the lead sponsor, the Palau International Ship Registry, as well as ABS, Bureau Veritas, DESFA, Ocean King, RIMIA, RINA, Estudio di Navale. Thank you very, very much, not only for being sponsors with us here, but for being next to the Hellenic Short Ship Owners Association. Big applause, and a big applause in order to give them encourage to sponsor us again next year. Thanks a lot. Of course, of course. You know, when you make steps, you have to be approved. You have to be, in other words, auspicized. So, what an honor to have this conference under the auspices of the European Sourcing Network, of course. How else can it be? And you have, we all know that at least in Europe we have the 53% of the owned fleet, as is Greek. LA Republic. Naftiko Emeltirio Elados, sorry, okay, it's the same, you know, we cooperate so close, so we feel like being ministers, you feel like being suburb saving. The Ellenico Eburgio Ebolikis Aftilias, Hellenic Republic of Ministry of Maritime Affairs and Policy, Hellenic Chamber of Shipping, and the Association of Passenger Shipping Companies, Mr. Sakelis has just called us, he couldn't be now with us, so very big applause and very, very thank you for being hosted under this hostage. And last but not least, we have to thank our media sponsors. You know, media are the ones that they forward the information. And according not only to my opinion, we have the most quality category of journals of all business sectors in Greece. So, thanks very much to the media supports, El Navi, Maritime Economics, Maritime GR, Nafte Boriki, Naftika Chronika, News from Naftiliaki, who organized this event, Mrs. Danai Vasilaki, Pyreus 365 GR, and Shipping. Big applause to the Street Exusia. So, of course, I have to thank also very much the board of the Lengsor Chipporn Association who entrusted me today to be the coordinator. I, 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 I was written uh, in the program of chairman, but we know that praise to the chairman are many here. Presentation is only one. So, now it's time to go and to explain to you how we are, we are going to develop uh, this nice, I hope, uh, conference. First of all, as you know, we have five, five, uh, five discussions, five panels. We have to respect. So, of, uh, despite I think that I'm a sweet guy, I will be a bit strict with this watch, with this timer, because uh, we have, uh, you know, not, not to speak a lot. Or I know you have a lot of important things to mention, but uh, I think that time is money for all of us, and uh, we, we, we got to be very refreshed. Of course, we, we have uh, arranged for you to be refreshed, because in intervals we will have coffee and a very nice lunch. So, what will be the procedure of every panel? First of all, we have moderators. The moderators will be the captains of the panels. Then, the moderators will have to keep the time, otherwise I will knock to them a bit, or this makes an alarm, t -t 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 -t, like the ones that we woke up before two, three hours to come to this event, without any snoozer. Okay. So, then, after the five minutes presentation of each of the speakers, the moderator will pose them two questions. And then, you know, the slide, I, I just read, slide, slide. From slide, what does it mean slide, slide in English language? Slide, I read, is the act of moving along a smooth surface, smooth surface is you, while contact, while maintaining the continuous contact. So, why I said that? This conference will be an interactive conference. You are not only just sitting on these comfortable chairs, listening to the panels, then the floor will be yours. Why, why is it slide? Because we're going to pass to the slide. Slide, please. Slide, what's slide? Okay, now you all have mobiles. We have Wi-Fi here at the Anaftiko uh, Omilo Elados, but also please log in now to your mobiles. Please have your mobiles and log in to slide.com. 
It will be very interesting and interactive. Slide.com, www.slide.com. Then it sends a, a password. You will you will press the password eight nine four zero. And whilst you are going to uh, to see and uh, listen the important things of the panelists, you will pose your questions. And then if you like a question that has been posed, either anonymous or with the name, it's your option. And then when you see a question being posed, maybe you don't want to pose your question, you like that question, that's the network, that's the cooperation, you press like and the top two or three questions will be definitely asked. Then of course, it's according to every moderator to choose any of the other questions to be replied by our guests. So, I don't want to spend more of your time, I think that uh, uh, I, I gave you a very small uh, introduction about how is the procedure of every panel. So the first, the first panel, the first session, the title is Prospect and Challenges of European Union Sources Shipping. Well, I, you say, you know something, you can spell challenge, but you cannot spell challenge without the word change. If you are going to rise to the challenge, then you have to be, to be prepared to change. And you know where from the word prospect is derived from? Well, the word prospects, as we say, is derived from the Latin, pro spitere, which means pro is forward and spitere is to look. This is the prospects. So, I, I read the, the, both the moderator and the panelists. And I wouldn't think any better guests to speak us about the prospects and challenges of the European Union sources format. So, let me please introduce you the moderator of the panel, Mr. Dr. Ioannis Tatokas. Please uh, give applause to Dr. Ioannis Tatokas. Thank you very much for being with us here. Then, again, we shall, we shall listen very, very carefully, you gave us a very, very nice introduction. Mr. Vasilis Logothetis from the Hellenic Chamber of Shipping, one of our panelists. Thank you very much. Yes, applause. Applause is always acceptable and, and never taxable. So, what else? Can be a panel without any professor. Ms. Maria Lekaku from the University of the Aegean, our second panelist. Welcome, Ms. Lekaku. Sources Shipping. Inland Waterway Promotion Center. What a neater stopping. Mr. Markus Nolke. Mr. Markus Nolke, welcome in Greece. Welcome to the panel. We're looking forward to listening to you. Hello, Grunoli. Please take your seat. Then we cannot move any forward without having money. So we have here European Investment Bank. We have Mrs. Maria Jumanika. Ms. Maria Jumanika, welcome. I hope you brought us loans, subsidies, everything. Thank you very much. Take your position. Of course, now it's time for the technology. Time for the technology, and uh, here we have the honor to have Dr. Ahmed Youssef, Master Mariner, Professor of Maritime Technology, Director. Thank you very much. Welcome, Grace. Hello. Thank you very much. So, this is the nice panel. Dr. Ioannis Theotokas. The time is 10. 40, I would say, 10.35, but I give you five minutes tips, okay? So you have, you have one hour and 30 minutes, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm very lucky because uh, Mr. Alexandratos has not left uh, much for me. Uh, he explained what I'm going to do uh, for you today as a moderator. Uh, he gave an excellent uh, uh, explanation of uh, what this session is going to be uh, discussed about. And uh, along with uh, distinguished speakers uh, uh, that we had the chance to uh, hear this morning, uh, he set the standards very high and increased the expectations from all of us about what we are going to hear uh, in this session, uh, in this first session of the uh, short shipping day. In any case, I would like to warmly welcome you uh, in this uh, first session, uh, which will discuss about the prospect and uh, the challenges and the ways to change uh, for the short sea shipping. I'm sure that the topics that will be discussed uh, by our distinguished speakers
speakers and the discussion that will follow, the interactive uh, uh, session that will follow, will make us wiser on a wide range of uh, issues for the sorts of shipping. I would like at this point to uh, congratulate the Helen Shortsi Ship Owners Association and the organizers for the organization of this day and uh, for inviting me to be here today to be the moderator of this uh, session. As already said, the topic is the prospects and the challenges for the EU Shortsi Shipping. Very interesting, but also very wide. But uh, the organizers uh, took care of it, and uh, the panel uh, is uh, in the panel. Uh, there are distinguished speakers, experts on their field, who either work or conduct research on uh, the issues of sort of shipping. So they will give us the state of the art on their field. I'm sure there is much we will learn by listening to the presentations and, uh, of course, to the discussions that uh, we will follow, uh, either for new regulations and the environmental issues for the Mediterranean area, uh, the challenges for the future, the, for, for the increase of cargoes for short sea shipping, uh, the future for the European short sea in different areas of Europe, the cases for the financing <coughs> of sorts of shipping, I'm sorry. Uh, the role of the education for filling the gaps of the people employed either ashore or on board the ships of this sector. Mr. Alexandratos explain what the procedure uh, will be, what is the structure for this session. So uh, I'm going to uh, present you the speakers, uh, starting by uh, the first speaker, which is Mr. Vasilios Logotetis. Uh, who is, you have already uh, the chance to uh, attend the presentation of uh, Mr. Logothetis uh, uh, on behalf of uh, Helen Chamber of Stripping. Uh, Mr. Logothetis is a spawn, uh, the CEO of uh, a company with uh, a vast tradition in the area of short shipping, the Bros Lines. Uh, the Bros Lines is an active operator of uh, bulk carriers, ultramax bulk carriers, for many years, and for uh, more than 70 years operates uh, a line uh, for breakback bulk cargoes from uh, uh, Northern Europe to uh, Eastern Mediterranean and uh, Black Sea. The topic uh, he will present to us is the new regulation and environmental changes in the Mediterranean. Mr. Logothetis, you have to Back in 1979, Greek seafarers and ship owners founded Helmepa, the Hellenic Marine Environment Association, a pioneering volunteer organization that aimed to safeguard the seas from ship-generated pollution. The example of Almepa was followed by other maritime nations, thus the principle aimed to promote an, an environmental consciousness and the spirit of safety towards achieving quality shipping was spread around. Since 1954, <coughs> IMO conventions, regulations and declarations have occurred, the most important of which was MARPOL 73-78, measures to battle climatic change in the top issue in our days. The shipping community is a forerunner in this effort despite the fact that shipping is the less pollutant means of transportation. Shipping is committed in fulfilling the goals set for the reduction of greenhouse gases and the preservation of the marine environment. 
This involves uh, enormous investment in scrubbers, uh, ballast water management system, low sulfur marine fuels uh, or retrofitting of engines for dual fuel, etc. Improved designs of ships, the use of LNG on some trades, slow speed, and other measures and technologies are being examined. Greek shipping both at home waters, in short seas, and trades, and interna internationally, are prompted adapting the IMO regulations, although there are serious reservations and concerns. <laughs> Factors. Implementation of MPC 72 2018, reduction of gas uh, uh, emissions, uh, uh, 1st January 2010, sulfur limit uh, on 0.5%, Marpol Annex 6, BWM Convention, EDI for Roro Cargo and Roro Passenger Ships. Lack of financial stimulation for the replacement of existing aging fleet, a shortfall of connecting European Europe facility, CEF, LNG bunkering infrastructure, infrastructure for cold ironing while at birth and for recharging batteries, quality and compatibility of marine fuels, consequences to the environment and to the med economies should the move for second ECA zone in the med go ahead, modal shift, internal intra-med traffic hub and spoke system, how infrastructure will be affected, new roads, bridges will be required, existing port infrastructure will be dormant. Regularity, polyphony, IMO, European Union, other. Thank you, Mr. Logothetis, for presenting us uh, all issues related to the environmental uh, and uh, um, <coughs> let's say, uh, challenging issues related to it as regards the sorts of shipping and shipping in general in the Mediterranean. And thank you for uh, being on time in your presentation. As you might have seen in the program, the next speaker would be uh, Dr. Alkis John Cores. Uh, Dr. Cores goes here with us today. Uh, however, a very um, inelastic uh, engagement he had uh, and forcing him to uh, depart. We hope that he will be back uh, on time and uh, will give uh, us uh, his presentation. If not, uh, my colleague Maria Lekaku will uh, help uh, Dr. Cores with it. Uh, but in any case, uh, Professor Lekaku uh, is now the next uh, speaker and uh, I have the pleasure to uh, present uh, uh, Professor Lekaku to you. Uh, he is a professor at the University she is a professor at the University of the Aegean and the Dean of uh, uh, Business School of the University. And uh, if uh, someone would ask me uh, to name a person from uh, the academia uh, that for a long period studies and uh, research uh, issues related to the sorts of shipping, I would name Maria Lekaku. So, Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for your kind words. This is this is true. I I'm very uh, I have very strong feelings because I was uh, a, a very young researcher in the beginning of 90s when I have the I had the chance to attend the first short sea roundtable in Rotterdam in 1992. So I'm very very happy and proud of being member of this community and of this uh, uh, 
day, a special day that also we celebrate the short sea shipping day in this place, exactly in this place where it's, it's like a lighthouse of Greek shipping in between Piraeus and the islands which is the center of a short sea in Greece. So I will move forward. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about uh, the, 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 the problems with the definition, but I would like to focus on one word that is uh, unanimously accepted. Short sea shipping is defined by distance. Distance. This is something that really differentiates short sea shipping from ocean, from ocean sea shipping. This is the regional, the spatial dimension Short sea is, is close to the coast. That's why in the in the 40s, uh, short sea shipping association is called coaster, and also Mediterranean. Two two dimensions that that describe the essence of short sea shipping in Greece and I could say all over Europe. So. Mostly, when we are talking about short sea shipping, we are focused on its impact upon regional, peripheral economies, and also in terms of uh, employment or uh, uh, income. I'm not going to say uh, to focus on short sea shipping in Europe. It is already said. But now I'm going to use a, a slide that is uh, borrowed from a, a Mediterranean program. This is, they said, the dark side of blue. Uh, all, uh, if you also see the points, are also close to the coast. And this is the, the big challenge for the blue economy, I would say, because short sea shipping is one of the, of the pillars of blue economy for Europe. And talking about short sea and the challenges and the impact, I, I could say that the, the point that I would like to stress is on the relationship between short sea shipping and the Agenda 2030. The, universally adopted model of progress, I could say, of development. So how is, how, how could, how short sea shipping could contribute to sustainable development? This is a big issue. And to the best of my knowledge and my research, I think that short sea shipping could contribute dramatically, drastically to this balance because the, back, the background of uh, the 17 sustainable development goals is a balance, is a balance between society and economy, is a balance between environment and technology, is a balance between citizens and politicians, it is a balance between lobbies as said. So I'm, I'm, now I'm going, I'm going to be to run. Uh, from, our, from our research that is concluded uh, last year on, uh, on the impact of short sea shipping on the economy and also to the characteristics of the Greek short sea shipping, uh, we have some points to, uh, to contribute. That Greek ports are for, for short sea shipping points of goods transshipment and also from a research uh, back in the, uh, for blue growth, short sea shipping for, for Greece is the third most important maritime economic activity. Uh, I'm going to go further. Uh, we, we, uh, we remarked a big concentration in Piraeus uh, and also the, uh, the other important ports are nearby except the case of Thessaloniki and Volos and this, uh, on these ports there is a big concentration, 75% se uh, of the total volume. So big concentration in terms of port. 50% uh, of the cargo transported by short sea shipping from uh, 2014 to 2017 is oil, was oil. So we have also a specialization in transport, in liquid transport. 
oh, 70, only seven, only uh, 25 percent of the Greek flags fly the Greek flag uh, because of mainly of uh, of, uh, of rules regarding to money. And uh, the main origin, uh, the major origin of, uh, for, of, for transported goods go, uh, were Russia, Iraq, Iran, Egypt, and Turkey. And from the EU point of view, mo uh, the majority for, trans for, import, uh, of go uh, for imported cargoes was Italy, and from the other side, Turkey. So I could say that uh, if I if I, I have uh, to focus on one point, this is that we should uh, I, I focus on the full integration of short sea shipping into the transport uh, network. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lekaku, for staying on time. And uh, uh, I know how difficult uh, it was because I know how passionate you are with the topic uh, you just presented to us, the parading of uh, Greek short sea shipping. Uh, now uh, I have the pleasure to invite uh, Mr. Marcus Nolke, the Managing Director of Short Sea Shipping uh, Inland Waterway Promotion Center, uh, which, uh, who will present the topic Short Sea Shipping in Northern Europe, Challenges, Outlook and Differences to Southern Europe. Mr. Nolke uh, has a, an experience of about 20 years uh, in business uh, and uh, after that experience he was uh, appointed as managing director of the German Social Shipping Inland Waterway Promotion Center in Bonn. Uh, the promotion center is a public-private partnership to promote potentials of short sea and inland waterway shipping and is located in the office of the German Ministry for Transport in Bonn and uh, Mr. Nolke has the reading uh, the lean grow in uh, the center. We are ready to hear you. Yes, good morning. <laughs> good morning, everybody. Thank you very much indeed for your very kind invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Germany was the host of the last year's uh, conference in, in Lübeck, and uh, I hope uh, when we have our ESN meeting in the afternoon, we will find a uh, new place for the next year's uh, conference. But now it's very good to be here in uh, Piraeus. Greece is a great seafarers nation, so it is really the best place to do this conference here uh, today. Uh, the biggest challenge for me is to shorten my presentation because I thought I have 10 minutes. Now I have only five minutes for such a topic, which is uh, would take time for one day. Uh, so I would like to keep it very brief uh, uh, over the agenda. A short introduction of SP Germany, where we, uh, what we do, and a uh, short overview about the significance of short sea shipping in uh, Germany and in the North Range ports to give you an idea about that. And then, of course, I would like to uh, highlight uh, three uh, challenges and an outlook for the uh, next, uh, next time, next uh, years. A uh, brief overview about uh, SPC Germany. Uh, the only thing I would like to say now, I think you get the presentation uh, later, uh, is that uh, we have a little difference to other short sea promotion centers because uh, we are also an inland uh, waterway promotion center because uh, we have a, a significant, um, oh, sorry, I, I have to switch, <laughs> a significant inland waterway system in, in Germany. Here you can see the European uh, map and it's easy to see that it's only in Germany and especially in the Netherlands and the Belgium where it's a significant inland waterway uh, system. Up to 7,300 7, kilometers uh, inland waterway system we have here in, in Germany and you can say that uh, something around 5,000 uh, kilometers are suitable for uh, uh, freight uh, transport. And uh, this is the reason why the German Ministry of Transport has uh, instructed us to promote uh, short sea shipping and uh, and inland uh, waterway uh, shipping um 
So we have in our daily work uh, four major activities. This is information and consulting of shippers and forwarders. Shippers have the cargo, forwarders move the cargo. And then we are very active in training and education uh, matters. We try to uh, to interest uh, the young people as early as possible for, for short sea shipping, uh, for inland waterway, and for multimodal transport uh, solutions. Then, of course, we have marketing and PR activities like the conference like today. Day and uh, networking. Uh, when I discussed uh, uh, the topic uh, uh, before the conference uh, with EFA, the first proposal was uh, to present some uh, best practice, uh, but then I changed the topic. But I find, uh, found a best practice uh, project uh, which we have uh, uh, done in the past uh, regarding uh, traffic from, uh, uh, from uh, south uh, to north. You can see here it. It is uh, some years uh, ago, but uh, this project uh, was uh, successful. On uh, the left hand, you can see uh, the route, uh, uh, the, the road, the truck route uh, through Europe from uh, Catania to, uh, uh, to to Lübeck in northern Germany. Lübeck is uh, one of the most important ports for the Baltic area, and especially for uh, paper products. And uh, here you can see the truck road uh, through uh, Germany. And yes, Yes, as I told you, the project uh, was uh, successful. We could shift, or my, my former colleagues uh, could reach that uh, the cargo was shifted from uh, road uh, to sea. This is a short sea uh, solution, and uh, with the result of uh, we could avoid 12.6 uh, million ton kilometers a year on the roads or 200 trucks uh, per year. So this is an example for a best practice uh, project regarding information and consulting of uh, shippers. Okay, um, I go over this uh, significance of short sea shipping for Germany. Uh, the situation uh, we have in our daily work is when we talk to uh, port representatives or authorities, uh, they think uh, most of the cargo throughput of the German ports is, is global, is America, is Asia. Uh, this is uh, their uh, opinion, but the reality uh, is uh, is uh, different because in fact 62% of the total cargo throughput of German ports is related to short sea shipping, container bulk and uh, project cargo and uh, especially uh, the ferry uh, volume which is not to underestimate and this is uh, from an uh, uh, important magazine in Germany and uh, the headline is, 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 is correct, is very good for us, short sea trade is defining for uh, German ports. Uh, we ask um, we ask a partner organization as, uh, of us last year to work all to work out a small study for us regarding the volume of uh, container shipping or the, imp the significance of short sea container shipping for the north range uh, ports north range ports Schmitz, Hamburg, Bremerhaven, Rotterdam, Antwerp, Zeebrug, and uh, Le Havre. And uh, because uh, the statistics are not so good, we have on hand uh, regarding uh, short sea trade. So, and they worked out or they figured out that we have a total volume in these uh, six uh, ports of 14.7 million TEU, which means 34% of the total container throughput in the north uh, in the north range ports. And then in Germany, we have a discussion that many people say, "Yeah, that's all is feeder shipping. Feeder shipping is." not short sea shipping. We say, of course, feeder shipping is short sea shipping. It's a part of short sea shipping. We have two dif different aspects of short sea shipping. Uh, the one is the transshipment, feeder shipping, with 7.8 million uh, TUs per year. It was in 2017, and 5.3 million TU on short sea, short sea land, for example, Hamburg, uh, Bilbao, and here feeder shipment, uh, Hong Kong, Hamburg, and Hamburg, Stockholm, uh, for example. So, uh, short sea container volume uh, for the North Range ports, uh, more than one third of the total cargo throughput is very important. Okay, um, so a very big challenge uh, is the Brexit, of course, and it will be interesting for me to hear from you uh, uh, during the conference, what do you think about the Brexit? This is a scenario from one of our members, it's a forwarding uh, company uh, with a very strong uh, uh, business uh, from and to the UK and uh, the United Kingdom is a very important market for the market for the short sea sector for the northern short sea uh, sector and this is uh, what they
they fear if we will have a hard uh, or non-regulated uh, Brexit. Huge problems at the borders um, because customs clearance will, be clearance will be required for imports and exports and this can lead to uh, uh, huge uh, problems especially in, in Dover which is one of the main gates to and from the United Kingdom. Uh, so there is a study in the market uh, which says that we will have a traffic backups up to uh, almost uh, 30 kilometers, no, sp no uh, space problems in the ports, uh, not only in Dover and all other ports where uh, are ferry connections to United Kingdom, uh, uh, problems with sanitary facilities and also uh, and like this, and this lead to uh, um, standstills up to three days, demerge costs and uh, later to the uh, uh, matter that we uh, think that trucking films, trucking films will not be willing to drive to the UK yeah, because they don't know how, how much time they need uh, uh, for, the, for the way and how much waiting time they have and they have and who will pay the demerge costs and so on. And this member says an, an alternative could be to switch from truck to a container business. In a container shipping uh, you have uh, the advantage that you can arrange uh, seven days uh, uh, free of demerge in the port so you're a little bit more flexible uh, regarding uh, the customs clerics, for example. And we have uh, received a number of inquiries from, uh, from shippers the last uh, months, especially from, uh, for example, uh, we VW, biggest car producer or second biggest car producer in the world. They ask us uh, for help and they want to uh, switch their uh, trucking business to a container uh, business. But so far we have no deal with the uh, United Kingdom, uh, the EU and the United Kingdom. So uh, we have to wait what will happen. This is one of the scenarios. Uh, let me go first to this a challenge, environment and climate. IMO regulations, of course, uh, you uh, uh, will have new regulations uh, here in the Mediterranean beginning of uh, next year. There's a difference to the northern area because the uh, uh, Baltic Sea and the North Sea are so-called emission uh, control areas uh, since a long time, since May 2006, <laughs> sorry, for, to German, uh, for the Baltic Sea, for, for SOX, for sulfur, uh, 2021 for NOx and the North Sea, including the English Channel since November 2007 for, uh, for SOX and also from January 22 to, for NOx. So that means uh, uh, you have to use uh, onboard fuel oil with the sulfur content of no more than 0.1% since January 2015 uh, as opposed to the limit of 1% in effect up till uh, 31st December 2014. This was really a huge uh, challenge uh, for the uh, ship owners in this area to ful fulfill these requirements and uh, on the short term this has led, led to increased use of MGO, uh, of course the installation of uh, scrubbers. Uh, scrubbers uh, I know there's a discussion about how sensible are scrubbers. Uh, hybrid technology, some ferry operators use the hybrid technology, uh, flattener uh, rotors and so on. But uh, in the meantime uh, uh, we can say that LNG is, uh, is increasingly uh, becoming established as an alternative uh, uh, fuel. Uh, the good news is uh, that uh, till today uh, we could not determine a significant modal shift from, uh, from uh, sea to road. Yeah, not an increase, but uh, uh, the cargo is still, uh, most of the cargo is still uh, on, the, on the sea. And uh, the Mediterranean will uh, follow uh, the new IMA regulations in uh, January of next year. And maybe it's interesting uh, for here to know what uh, the ship owners in uh, the northern area have done to, to fulfill these uh, requirements. Okay, I go back uh, to an outlook. Uh, we had the European elections on May 26. 
so we will uh, have. Yeah, I'm just finished. Uh, we have a new. Uh, we'll get a new commission in the next uh, weeks or months, and maybe we will have a new uh, uh, commissioner for transport. I don't know, uh, Antoine. <laughs> you will also waiting for this decision. And uh, what is sure, uh, sure is that we will get a new white paper on transport. And I think uh, now is the best time uh, to work out uh, strategies and recommendations which we, which we can give, for example, uh, Antoine on hand. That was, this will be considered in the new uh, white paper. Uh, I don't know if it is will coming next year uh, because uh, the period of uh, the old white paper ends uh, uh, next year. And in the um, actual um, white paper was one important conclusion, 30% of long haul, it, uh, long haul over 300 kilometers freight transport by road is to be shifted to other modes of transport such as rail and ships. So in the afternoon we have our ESN meeting and uh, I think we should discuss how we can bring our interests into the new uh, white paper. So I think uh, that was all. Yeah, okay. Uh, finally, uh, although there are some changes in the shipping area regarding environmental matters, but of course shipping is still the most environmental friendly mode of transport and short sea shipping plays a leading role because all new technologies first will be uh, tested in the short sea sector mainly yeah, on the short roads. So this is, I think, a very important message we should uh, pull out to the market why short sea shipping is so interested. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Norke, for your excellent presentation. Um, uh, up to now, we have heard many interesting uh, things about the challenges uh, and the need for change. Uh, but uh, this need needs capital, and uh, we have to find out where this capital uh, is. And uh, for this reason, I will uh, invite uh, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Maria Zumanika, uh, who is the advisor of the European Investment Bank, uh, the source of uh, the needed capital. Uh, Mr. Manika uh, is an advisor, as I said, uh, at the European Investment Bank, uh, at the Athens office, covering, um, covering, among other things, the transportation sector. She joined the bank in uh, 2017 and has nine years of blended experience in financial services, including banking and uh, financial consulting. Mr. Manika, the floor is yours. And thank, thank before, uh, uh, sorry for interrupting, uh, I would like to invite you all to uh, register to the platform uh, www.slide.com uh, to enter the code 8949 and to write your questions because without this procedure the interactive aspects of uh, this uh, discussion will not be supported. So please enter the platform and uh, use the code 8949. 40. 40. 40. Oh, I'm sorry. It is written 49. It's my mistake. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I also thought we had 10 minutes. We have five, so I'll try to make it quick. Thank you very much for having me here. I'm Maria Jumanika from the EIB Athens office. We'll cover today three things. One, who is EIB, our role. Two, our transport lending policy and our eligible investments in the sector. And third, hopefully uh, show you a couple of examples of cases that we have financed. So we are the EIB. We were established with the Treaty of Rome in 1958. Um, we provide we provide long term finance in support of investment projects. We are a policy driven bank and our lending activities are guided by the EU policies and guidelines. Ninety percent of the lending activity that we do is within the EU. We raise the resources that we need to finance the investments on the capital markets and our AAA rating allows us to get the best terms. And being a not-for-profit institution, we are able to provide these terms to the beneficiaries of the loan. We have become the largest multilateral lender in, and borrower in the world. Last year, we signed financing for 55 billion worth of uh, projects that, a total, with a total investment exist, exceeding 150 billion. 
This is a bit of an overview of our financing instruments. We are based on three pillars, lending, blending, and advisory. Lending is the biggest part of what we do. Uh, we provide direct loans to public and private institutions uh, for single projects investments. Typically, our minimum project size would be 25 million. However, especially for Greece, this is lowered to 15 million with uh, EIB financing up to 50% of that. Sometimes, secondly, we blend our lending together with other sources of finance in order to make it more efficient. This typically can be with the provision of a guarantee in order to uh, create a risk sharing mechanism, as is the green shipping guarantee loan that we will see later on, or else with the Commission as well through its Connecting Europe facility blending calls. We also have our advisory pillar where our technical experts and other resources can help promoters make the projects more bankable. Transport lending has been traditionally one of our main activities. Over the last 10 years, we have lent 135 billion in transport overall, may, mainly in roads, rail, and urban infrastructure. Uh, maritime transport lending, which includes both shipping and ports, have been 8 billion, or 6% of that. Our lending activities uh, on the sector are guided from our transport lending policy. This is available or online. And being a policy-driven bank, we are mainly focused on growth, environment, safety, and R&D. The eligibility of the maritime uh, projects are based on large, two large themes. The one is strengthening the trans European transport network, the 10T, uh, and the second is sustainable transport. The first one includes investments in ports, their connections, as well as other essential for ports operations, but also motorways of the seas projects that promote the maritime links. The second one, which also includes modal shifts, such as short sea shipping, uh, is focused on reducing vessel emissions. And what we're talking about here is new vessels, potentially for replacement of older vessels, vessel conversion and retrofitting, which can include scrubbers, ballast water treatment systems, so on and so forth, and shipping R&D programs. In order to support the sector, EIB has developed two dedicated programs related to green shipping. These are more or less the same. The main difference is that the one works through partner financial, partner financial institutions, whereas the other is direct with EIB. The first one is the Green Shipping Guarantee Program. This is essentially a 750 million guarantee scheme, an intermedi guaranteed intermediated loan working through partner financial institutions. Right now, we we have uh, partnerships with five financial institutions. This is Societe Generale, BNP Paribas, ABN AMRO, ING, and Credit Agricole. The transactions under this program, the transactions are originated from the partner financial institutions and are assessed by them and then on are presented to EIB for internal review and pricing. Our co-financing rates under this program is up to 50% for new vessels and up to 100% for the green components of the retrofitting operation. Uh, as said, this is a program that works through intermediaries, but for large investments, we have also the second program, the Green Shipping Program Loan. Uh, the main differences to the previous one is that this one is direct, so it's a direct individual EAB loan to a borrower. Contact is made through EAB local offices, like ourselves, and financing rates are up to 50% debt financing, regardless of whether it's retrofitting or new vessels. I wouldn't like to say too much on this slide. This is our typical standard main terms for corporate lending. What I would just like to highlight here is the minimum sizes. So we're talking about minimum 55 million, uh, uh, 15 million of uh, project and uh, seven and a half million EIB loan. The eligibility criteria, I think, that we raised a bit uh, before, but just to underline that we're talking about green investments on projects that uh, depict significant European interest, be it a new building vessel or a retrofit. And uh, another interesting thing to mention is that we are technology agnostic in the sense that all technologies uh, that demonstrate reduction in depollution or, de or decarbonization will be assessed. 
uh, a full project assessment will take place by our sector engineers. And that includes, for example, project description, vessel routes, shipyard uh, selection, and environmental and energy efficiency gains. And going quickly through a couple of examples of uh, projects that we have financed. These are both new buildings. These are uh, both under one of the two program loans, either the guarantee or the green shipping program loan. The first one is a uh, new LNG dual fuel ferry uh, covering, uh, doing, actually connecting France and the UK. Uh, this was constructed in an EU shipyard. The second one is construction of three new eco cement carriers, again mainly operating on European ports and again constructed by uh, an EU shipyard. This is a quick example of a retrofitting operation. This is for fin lines. It's uh, implement installation of scrubbers on 22 rowers and ropax and uh, propulsion and hull efficiency measures on another 11. Again, vessels operating on European waters and manufacturers and shipyard were EU ones. And uh, finally, a bit of an older project, but useful to, to mention, just as a different example, this is a financing of an R&D program for uh, FIC and Thierry. Uh, and the R&D activity is focused mainly energy efficiency, optimization of ship design, and uh, several studies. So that's from me. Hope we are in time. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for coming contact. Thank you, Mr. Manika, for explaining us how the European Investment Bank uh, will, uh, could help in uh, uh, renewal of the fleet of uh, Sochi shipping. And thank you for trying to remain on time. And uh, uh, I hope you understand it's always difficult uh, to ignore. Uh, uh, to, to, to follow the limitations when uh, you hear about uh, money, about the capital. Uh, I would like now to uh, invite to the floor the doctor and captain Ahmed Youssef. Uh, up to now we have uh, heard a lot about uh, challenges, about the need for change, as uh, Mr. Alexandrato said, but change needs skills, needs new competencies, so uh, Dr. Youssef will uh, present to us a new uh, methodology which is related to the training of people uh, in shipping in general, but uh, more particularly uh, for people uh, working in the industry. Dr. Ahmed Youssef uh, is the director of the International Forum for Maritime Transport in Arab Academy for Science and Technology in Maritime Transport, and uh, he is a master mariner that worked on board different type of vessels uh, for many years. Uh, he introduced the Dell in interactive maritime education and training application that is beyond e-learning concept, as he holds the intellectual property uh, copyright uh, property certificate of this application. Dr. Youssef, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, this presentation. It's always been my pleasure to come to Greece. Uh, first of all, I, my presentation will be divided into two sections, so let's start and I'll, I'll, I'll maintain the five or six minutes as agreed. The first part of the presentation uh, from my organization at the Arab Academy, we are the te technical maritime and shipping arm of the Arab States League. So we do provide consultancy and advising uh, services to the Arab countries, port authorities, in whatever matter related to the shipping and the maritime in the whole 22 countries. So uh, from a personal level, and I've been in a talk yesterday with the uh, some of the ship owners in Alexandria in Egypt and we need to investigate the possibility of initiating a collaboration between our ship owners and the Hellenic Short Sea Shipping Owners Association in order to see the possibility of establishing a Roro line or a Roro routes between uh, Greece and Alexandria because I think Egypt is going to be the gateway to whatever beyond 
the other sides of the world to connect uh, with the concept of the one belt that is going to take place soon so i think this will be much more efficient less competition than doing it in container ships or in oil tankers or bulk carriers so i, would, I think it could it could be uh, promising if we can start investigating the possibility of establishing a, a rural route between egypt and greece uh, this presentation basically is the main ob its main objective is how to maintain the human element, how to keep developing the human element, how at least make him think uh, in the future. Uh, this has always been a challenging part, especially that the technology is turning everything forward and it's moving very fast. Uh, you, you've been talking about the autonomous vessels, which is already a reality, and I think this is the future of shipping by any means. I, yeah, I know it's not in this decade, but I it might be very soon than we do expect. Uh, this regarding the technical work on board the ships, regarding the corresponding exchanging documentations, approvals, I think the blockchain also is an exist. The concept of Internet of Things or Internet of Everything is a reality and it's everywhere. So we have to cope with this and we have to keep on research and development in order to keep this spirit going on. So this from the perspective of autonomy, so this is a kind of an autonomous application in order to help whoever the student or the trainee or even the candidate who's working on board an oil oil and gas offshore unit or on board a vessel or in any workshop to do a kind of a self development, self studying application. The concept is called I training. I stands for interactive and intelligent training, which is a new technology enhanced learning tool. And it is exactly as the chairman had mentioned in the presentation that it is beyond the e-learning and the CBT, which is are too static and are not dynamic, and they are remote kind of training in this case you don't have any direct interaction with the real workplace that we need to get the candidate acquainted with or to develop his skills in a certain job so uh, the interactive training this is a new approach to implement the technology enhanced interactive personalized learning for candidates and trainees the main objective here is developing the trainee's theoretical background and transforming this theoretical knowledge into a practical one, enhancing his soft skills like sense of responsibility, self-reliance, logical skills, and leadership. And I think this is one of the challenging parts in any of the shipping companies departments, how to develop the caliber, how to keep on monitoring the development of the caliber, how to get the caliber acquainted with the new devices, the new workflow, all of these things. And of course, the cost effectiveness of such process has always been the cornerstone to take the decision whether to go ahead or not. Because the education and the training is the responsibility of the maritime universities and the employer as well to keep him growing. So uh, this is the, line, the typical way where to, to, to get acquainted with the equipment on board a ship, for an example, a book, a pen, and you go around on board the ship to get acquainted with everything. This is the way that we are working on it, and we have developed already a prototype, and had, it had been tested and validated, and it can be implemented on any type of ship. We are implementing it on board our training ship at the time being, but it can be implemented on board any, sh any ship, uh, in any uh, even lab or in a training facility, in-house training in a company. This is a mobile application which interacts with each item on board the ship. So once you get close to the item, this item will be presented in the handheld device and in a personalized manner. And this is the challenging part. It's the presentation of the training material in a personalized manner that adapts the, the learning style of the person in order to get things easier to his uh, knowledge. This is part of the screenshots that have been taken for this, uh, for the EPIRB, for the SART. Uh, 
and of course you have to go through quizzes, assessments, this could, it would be monitored by the administrator, this administrator could be the training supervisor or the training uh, officer in the shipping company and this system does not need the ship to be connected to the internet because everything will be stored in server on board the ship. Once the ship reach a coast and get connected like 4G or any GSM network, automatically it will synchronize this data by the internet, it's a very small number of files, and it will reach the administrator, let's say in Greece or in Norway, and he can see the progress, the achievements, what have done what. For an example, before working as a professor in the academy, I've been a marine officer. I work on oil tankers in Saudi Arabia, and, and I worked in a shipping company in Cyprus before for a long time. So we, we know it quite well how we hand over the ship. Once you reach the vessel on board, you meet the officer, you sign, he sign, you go around, and that's it. There is nothing that endorsed that this person had really familiarized with the vessel, had really acquainted with the vessel. This system can do so it, because it will endorse that this person had moved around and it will endorse that he had been acquainted with each single uh, item on board that he needs. It can be applied in training facilities. Uh, I don't mean just maritime universities. I mean on board uh, the vessels. I mean in the in-house training departments in any shipping company in the world. Uh, on board the vessels as well. It can be extended in the offshore installations, whether it's an offshore installation for oil and gas or an, a renewable energy offshore installations. It can be for the fisheries as well and for the shipbuilding and the ship repair. Uh, final slide, the conclusion. It will achieve a quality control training process, which is so far the training process has not been monitored. It has not been standardized even by the SCCW or by any shipping company. Everybody is doing what he thinks he's doing right. It's a harmonized training program in a standardized context. Uh, the personalized technology, it will enhance uh, and it will trigger the mentalities of the users because this item, the concept of adaptivity with the learning styles, it will be an added value in developing and retraining schemes for the workers, whether they are an onshore workers or seagoing personnel, retain and upskill workers, you can switch workers between a ship and another ship, between fishing boats or different types of vessel, and he will get acquainted uh, faster. And whenever he has a question on the spot in the real workplace, he will find the solution in a very comprehensive manner. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Youssef, for presenting us uh, the methodology. Now, in order to have more food for thought, I would like to uh, ask Professor Lekaku to present us the presentation of Dr. Alkis Kores, because I believe it's uh, very important and uh, poses so many um, interesting things uh, to take into account in our discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to our short sea days. More than 20 years have passed since short sea shipping became the object of new ideas and research proposals under different names in Europe. There were good reasons for this initiative, about which you are not I doubt aware. Road congestion, pollution of all of, of all short, need to reduce state, sp uh, state spending on motorways, channels and bridges. The sea requires no infrastructure spending. At the beginning it was thought that the benefits would come automatically and that cargoes would readily shift from land to sea. Time has shown, however, that the initial optimism was not sufficient to reap the benefits envisaged, so short sea shipping slowly fell behind road transport. We are going to touch upon a few less discussed factors that lie behind the observed slow growth in the volume of cargo carried on short sea vessels. Within the five minutes to allocate to his presentation. Following the rejection, first, lack of a single market for in the EU short sea. 
following the rejection of proposal of Commissioner Borg for the creation of a common maritime space in the EU's coastline, operators are back to square one with the inadequacies of the obsolete regulation 3577092. Each member state still remains its own territorial waters and the wide geographical areas between these national spaces are international, not EU waters. As a result, most intra-EU voyages between member states ports are and are treated as international voyages. The customs require extra time and cost for cargo clearance. International voyages are also open to all flagships, which leads to a very elastic supply curve, which makes sure freight rates remain at low levels. Second, many cargos remain non-shiftable from road to sea. Despite research and efforts from DG Move to encourage shifting to short sea shipping, it is now evident that for a variety of reasons, numerous categories of cargo cannot be shifted under the present regulatory arrangements. In short notice, consignments over short distances, the, the track remains the king. Even in long haul transport, the track is usually faster, although more expensive, easier to book and more user friendly. Unlike ships, trucks sail without stopping through customs in EU and unlike ships, use no ports to deliver door to door. It is possible, however, that further tonnage could be shifted shifted from different arrangements. Third, short sea shipping is reality, is not as cheap as deep sea transport. Economies of scales are dominant here. It has been demonstrated by Moore Stevens that the typical court, uh, cost of a short sea dry cargo ship is 0 0.52 US dollar per, to, uh, per dead weight ton per day, all inclusive, 5.8 times higher than of that of a Panamax. On tankers, the cost difference is even higher, starting at 7.7 times that of a Panamax tanker. They have also warned us about the rising operational cost of ships with high aids, which can be, throw, uh, be from 30% up to 100% stemming from higher fuel consumption, increased manning requirements, insurance costs, repair costs, and time lost in downtime. A combination of a smaller size and higher aids its impacts negatively service cost profitability and ultimately low investment in ships fourth the, uh, an aging short sea fleet becomes obsolete. By physical absolence, reference is made to the consequence of the old, stay, old age in ships, worn steel parts, machinery breakdowns, instead uh, increased risk of accidents with or without marine pollution and loss of human life. Vilnius and Vals have shown that there is a lot of old tonnage trading in the coast of Europe, 38% of it has been identified 25 years old or higher a decade ago. These are now account 45% due to the slow investment. By, ta uh, by technological obsolescence, one also makes reference to high pollution engines, mainly in socks and knocks, single bottom tankers, elevated fuel consumption need for larger crew and so on. The replacement of the old short sea ships of Europe is a 200 million, a billion euro project extending to a 25 to 30 years period. It is also a first class opportunity to revive the EU shipbuilding sector while improving short sea efficiency and contributing to a cleaner atmosphere. Fifth, 
Short sea ships spend more time in ports as they visit them much more often. Most even starter accountants, as say, have, saw, have also shown that the Panamax bulk carrier spends on average in ports roughly 16% of its trading time in a year, around 60 days having called at 20 ports. A short sea bulk carrier, despite shorter time in its voyage by approximately one day in its port call, will spend in, four, in 52 port call just under 30% of its trading, trading time in a year, namely 104 days. The cost of port agency expenses in the short sea constitute a much higher proportion of the freight or cost per ton for that matter than in a deep sea transport. The same logic applies mutandis mutandis to the other, to the other ship types including those employed in liner shipping. Time spent in sports not only is costly, but it drops short sea ships of trading time. In short sea, time in ports is 73% longer than in dry bulk uh, deep sea trading. So port efficiency is crucial for operators. So let him briefly recap on the main problems we are against and that could be done. First, no single market equals to port delays, market open to all flags, that we should revisit the board proposal about the common maritime space. Second, most cargos have already shifted equals to difficult progress. Incentives to shippers to choose the sea are needed. Short sea shipping is more expensive than deep sea, closer to tracking costs, so make the use of track more expensive. High age of, sea, of fleet uh, drives to increased cost and uh, absolences, so examine ways to support new construction on environmental crowds, revive EU sea building, and longer time spent in ports low, uh, goes to less trading time, less income, so set minimum standards to promote short sea efficiency. And uh, to, chase, to, to chase the new investment in short sea way, conflict, we have to, to resolve conflicting policies, high cost and low profit margins, and also poor legal frameworks. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Lekako, for being a very good uh, Alkis Kores in presenting He's his... <laughs> That's true. And now, after having heard all uh, this stimulating presentation, it's time to start the discussion. Uh, I will pose one question to each presenter, and after that I will uh, ask uh, the questions that you uh, have posed through the Slido.com uh, platform. Uh, allow me to start uh, with a question to uh, Mr. Uh, the keynote speaker, Mr. Kedrzewski. Uh, although uh, he was not uh, presenting a speech in uh, our panel, uh, I think uh, what uh, he presented to us is uh, very closely related to what we have heard in this panel. So uh, what I would like to ask uh, him is if there are any regional approaches that confine the effort of uh, DigiMove to plan and implement in its policy, and if there are, uh, what are the steps to overcome the obstacles that these regional uh, approaches uh, create uh, to the DG, DG move. Thank you very much. So, um, I mean, as as as, uh, as as such, the approach that we have towards our policy is is um, is towards the entire EU. So, as as such, this is uh, not necessarily. Um, Included within the uh, within our approaches to, to policy. However, um, I was discussing earlier at uh, during the during the, the the welcome coffee the access to funding issue, and the facto um, 
what is now the, the view of the motorways of the sea coordinator is to very much look as well at how sea basins are organized and whether there is a, a possibility to organize funding around sea basins opportunities and, and a better connections as well to the, uh, to the, to the network. Um, I think this is, a, this is an interesting element and in general also in the funding policy we very much uh, welcome the participation of different partners within projects and very often those partners are within the same region. So I think there, uh, uh, there, there, there are certainly possibilities to be explored. Thank you for your answer, and uh, I would like now to ask uh, Mr. Logothetis uh, if uh, uh, he could elaborate more on the way that IMO 2020, as regards the marine fuels, might affect the operation of short sea shipping, and if there are uh, any concerns, especially uh, while there are concerns on quality and compatibility of marine fuels. Yes. There are, there are two uh, aspects uh, in this problem. The one is technical, the other is economical. I will start uh, with the technical. As the industry transitions through the 2020 period, it is expected that most of the low sulfur fuel available to the marine industry will be blend products uh, commonly known as 0.50% uh, maximum sulfur fuel. These fuels uh, are uh, based uh, on vacuum gas uh, or blends uh, incorporating various heavy and line, uh, light refinery product steams, uh, including residual fuel soil and middle distillates. Uh, the quality concerns as, uh, associated with these fuels include uh, compatibility, stability, catalytic cut fines, density, flash point, ignition and combustion characteristics, usual components, poor point, viscosity, lubricant compatibility. So, uh, I believe that uh, uh, to a certain extent uh, uh, the ISO 1817 2017 uh, will cover those concerns uh, and eventually uh, there is uh, a lot of anxiety uh, which uh, uh, is exaggerated somehow but uh, of course uh, somebody cannot ignore uh, the uh, concerns uh, on this uh, subject uh, particularly since it is not tested yet. The other uh, uh, concern is uh, uh, the price. Uh, nobody can be uh, can give us uh, 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 exact figure. Uh, we are, uh, as it was mentioned, uh, liner operators, uh, and uh, we have been approached uh, by some of our uh, big uh, carriers uh, with whom we work on contract basis, uh, and they have asked us uh, uh, our rates uh, for 2020. And uh, we replied that we are not in a position to give a, a, a firm commitment yet because uh, uh, we don't know uh, what uh, the banker cost will be and the banker cost uh, in this uh, short sea shipping transport uh, is a very uh, important element. So immediately you realize uh, that uh, uh, the vessels uh, are coming uh, under a big pressure because obviously the um, trucks are in a position to to release quotes not only for uh, 2020 but but even further uh, and uh, Everybody expects uh, that these uh, bankers uh, will be more expensive, uh, which, may, which uh, already uh, uh, we have discounted uh, uh, the um, idea that uh, the 
uh, the sea transportation cost uh, will be more expensive as well, which again will be in favor of the other means of transport, the land means of uh, transport. Thank you, Mr. Logothetis. And uh, now uh, I would like to ask Professor Lekaku. Uh, you mentioned that sushi shipping is the third most important maritime activity in Greece, and you gave us some figures. Uh, could you further explain to us uh, how these figures came out? What is the methodology for these estimations? Yes. Thank you. Uh, First of all, uh, the, the first input about the, the, the third position of short sea shipping as the most important contributor uh, to the economy uh, was an output of a research, a, a, a European-wide research on the potential of sea basins. Uh, as I, I said in my presentation, short sea and other maritime activities has a strong um, uh, impact upon the economy. In order to, to count it, there, there, there is a, a study called EUNET, uh, carried out by COGEA and uh, funded by DG Mare, which uh, investigated and on, the, on the potential of various maritime activities. Uh, the method that uh, we were involved in this from the University of the Aegean and uh, as subcontractors and to, the, the method that we used were questionnaires and panel of experts. The main problem was that we do not have enough data to count the, the jobs and the income. This is the, the most crucial uh, 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 data that you need in order to imply input-output analysis. This was uh, the method, so it, it was input-output analysis based on questionnaires and panel of experts. Thank you very much for ah, and explaining. The, uh, yes, the, the, the figures about the potential of the Greek uh, short sea shipping uh, were output of, um, of a project carried out uh, uh, with uh, the Hellenic Statistical Authority as uh, output of a memorandum of understanding that we were signed and we used data from each ports on a, on a ship basis and uh, so and following the, the process of uh, elaborating data on, uh, on the most detailed basis, on a ship basis. Thank you. Uh, I will now uh, turn to Mr. Noke and I uh, would like to ask uh, what uh, he considers uh, as the single most important factor for the development of short sea shipping in Northern Europe? Uh, yes, I don't see a single factor. It's a uh, it's a mix of factor factors. But uh, I think uh, we have a general question. As long as the truck transportation is so cheap and so uh, so uh, flexible um, and has such a so short uh, transit times, it is a very big challenge uh, for the short sea shipping sector uh, to keep uh, compete against this. And this is a question for uh, the future. And this is maybe a discussion discussion uh, for the political uh, framework maybe in the in the new white paper how we can uh, uh, reduce uh, the cost difference between uh, short sea shipping and and road transportation sometimes short sea shipping is, is very attractive from uh, the, regarding the freight rates but in many times uh, the truck transportation is much more uh, is, is much cheaper than uh, than than the um, short sea transport because if a shipper or uh, when a shipper or a forwarder decides which mode of transport he uh, we will uh, he will use he 
check the costs and the transit time. This is still today uh, the most important factor for uh, a shipper or for a forwarder to decide which mode of uh, transport he will use. Yeah? And uh, I hope that uh, the discussions about the, the climate change and the climate matters uh, uh, will change uh, the things uh, because, as, we, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, 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 shipping is uh, very environmental friendly and if shippers want to uh, improve their uh, carbon footprint, they have to consider short sea shipping and this message, we must bring this message uh, to the market, but we need the support of the political framework and still today the decision is always under the consideration of the costs and the transit time and this is a challenge for the short sea shipping sector. Thank you. So the challenge is again for the regulator. Uh, I would like now to uh, ask uh, Ms. Zumanika, uh, what is the assessment of the European Investment Bank as regards the progress on the implementation of the green shipping programs? And uh, when I speak about progress and evaluation of progress, uh, I mean in terms of number of submissions and approvals, in terms of time and resources needed for submission and approval, and number of involved partners and uh, number of involved nations. Too much things together. Yes, indeed. Uh, I think that uh, we have made substantial steps with these programs in terms of mobilizing investments in, in the sector. Obviously, there's still way to go. Uh, just to take as an example the, the Green Shipping Guarantee Program, uh, we have, over the last uh, two or three years, if I'm not mistaken, we have managed to, to get on board five different financial institutions to, to get them on the platform. We have uh, signed three sub-operations. Uh, on the Green Shipping Program loan, we have signed another two operations, which are rather, rather large ones, and have taken a good a good bulk of, of the amount. Uh, we're assessing multiple projects right now uh, across both, both of the programs and when it comes to countries this covers the whole EU so this is from, fr we have projects from Greece and Cyprus to Italy and France and the Nordics and the Netherlands so uh, we have a good uh, differentiation when it comes to countries. Uh, timing and resources is always an issue uh, we, um, we we put special emphasis on the projects, on due diligence, and our sector engineers become practically part of the projects, and um, they are very much looking on, on the project itself, which means that from the time perspective, it can take from six to nine months from, from start to finish for a project, uh, and that's uh, typical across all of the type of projects projects that uh, the EIB is looking at. So uh, all in all, I think that we have made, there's still way to go, obviously, but uh, there are good steps uh, that have been taken to, to that direction. Thank you, so, thank you Mr. Manika. And uh, now for Professor Youssef, a question which is related to the methodology uh, he presented and the content of uh, the education that the method this methodology will uh, provide. Uh, have you made, made any estimation or research, for example, any training needs analysis uh, on the needs of people working in this uh, sector, in uh, short shipping sector, and uh, have you designed any specific uh, course packages, uh, course packages for uh, short shipping? It has not been tested for the short shipping uh, so far, but it had been tested for the seafarers. So it depends on the task of the seafarer. Uh, basically, we are talking about the officers, we are talking about the engineers, we are talking about the ratings and the mechanicals working on board. It has been tested, yes, but not in the uh, sea shipping, but it had been tested for uh, general cargoes, uh, work, uh, ship, ships working in the Mediterranean and in the Red Sea. So the target group is uh, seafarers, ratings or it's, officers? Yeah, it's, uh, ratings or officers and engineers with different ranks, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now... 
Uh, now, uh, the time for the interactive part of uh, this discussion. Uh, you can all see the questions uh, posed by you uh, and uh, ranked by you. Uh, so we are going to examine uh, as many as we can of these questions. And I will start with one by Nigel Laurie of Lloyd's List. Uh, which is why such shipping development and fleet is so different in South and North Europe when most of the cargoes are surely the same. Uh, I believe uh, all uh, speakers of the panel uh, can uh, answer the questions, but I will start with uh, the DG movement, uh, then uh, uh, with the northern part of uh, the short sea. Uh, uh, doctor, sorry to interrupt. Um, I want always to be polite. So, uh, the procedure, first of all, is in order to be interactive also for the likes, we will reply only the top three questions. Okay. And we have, unfortunately, because there are so called the panel speakers only 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, I think I think it's a it's a question that merits uh, some uh, further research. Probably the the first one, but my my first initial reaction would be probably uh, geography and history, uh, which are pro possibly uh, uh, two elements or two factors that may actually have quite an influence on how the sectors has developed so far. And uh, well, certainly there will be some uh, similarities in the in the in the type of of cargoes, though I think there are also certain routes that are more, for instance, um, you know, generally speaking, for instance, connection to highlands, where you're going to have, uh, when you're going to have more maybe passenger and rural traffic than other routes that are more uh, dedicated to, for instance, uh, feeder vessels. But maybe uh, 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 practitioners have uh, different views and, and more better statistics than I have from a very high level uh, perspective here. Thank you. Mr. Nolke? Yes, it's an interesting question because uh, I'm not sure if we have uh, um, uh, um, regarding shipping development and fleet uh, strong differences between uh, North and uh, Southern Europe. Uh, it's right, cargo are surely the same. We have a strong uh, Roro business in the Northern area, especially in the Baltic. You have it here in the in the Mediterranean. I see the, the biggest differences regarding the regulations, for example, the IMO regulations, uh, which will come up here in the Mediterranean. We have that uh, since some years in the northern area. This is the biggest difference in my uh, opinion, but not in the development and in the fleet. Thank you, Mr. Nolke. And now I would like to have the uh, opinion of the South. So, uh, Mr. Lothetis, would yes. you please uh, elaborate on it? Um, first of all, regarding the fleet, uh, um, traditionally, uh, and uh, I, uh, the people in, in the south, uh, they invest on larger size vessels. For example, the average size uh, uh, of the Greek fleet uh, is 70,000 tons. Uh, in Northern Europe, uh, uh, and particularly in Germany and in Holland, uh, uh, the investment is uh, on uh, smaller size vessels, uh, which uh, meet uh, more the requirements uh, of the short sea shipping. Uh, then uh, on, the, uh, on the aspect of the cargo transported, uh, in fact, uh, again, uh, from our experience as uh, uh, Embrus Lines li liner operators, uh, I can confirm that it is one-way traffic. Uh, there is uh, most of the cargo uh, originates from the north and ends in Mediterranean. So, uh, it is not true that uh, the same quantity of cargo moves uh, in uh, the north and in the south. Um, so, this is uh, my answer. Thank you, Mr. Lothetti. So, we have the view of the na uh, south, of the north, and of the DG move. And uh, let's now turn to the second question, which is uh, somehow provocative, uh, as uh, uh, it focuses on uh, the main challenge that the global uh, shipping industry faces nowadays. Uh, but it is uh, specifically uh, given for the Mediterranean. So, uh, Mr. Panos Zahariadis asks, uh, uh, 
uh, if with 0.5% uh, sulfur in 2020, Mediterranean will practically be an ECA. What's then the problem to take the next, the next step and be an official 0.1% ECA? I believe Mr. Logothetis uh, can start uh, the answer on it, and after that, uh, any other uh, speaker of the panel who wants to give uh, his uh, view on it. Environment uh, is very important, uh, definitely, for everybody, but uh, we must realize uh, that it has a cost. There is no free meal. And uh, uh, we have seen uh, that uh, the 0.1% uh, mainly is implemented uh, in very developed uh, countries in the north, in the Scandinavia, in the coastline, uh, in um, uh, United States, uh, in um, California. So, uh, if uh, the 0.1 percent will be implemented, uh, this uh, will increase uh, additionally the uh, cost uh, um, uh, for the southern countries uh, and uh, will uh, uh, make them less uh, uh, competitive uh, against the north, uh, which is a, a permanent complaint from the south uh, to the northern uh, um, uh, members. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lothetis. Uh, is anyone else uh, from the panel that uh, wishes to answer? Yes, please. I can't uh, answer this question, but uh, one uh, remark. Uh, in general, you can say shipping is global, at least it's European, and it's really hard, and this is what the northern ship owners complained when these uh, rules came up 2015, that we have different rules in the European area, and this is really hard to handle for a ship owner. For example, you want to sell a ship in the northern area to the southern area, or to the southern ship owner, it's not possible if you have another uh, 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 retrofitting and technolo technology on board of the vessel. Uh, so we need uh, the same rules at least in the European area. And that was no, not a good idea to, uh, to, to split uh, the European area, and especially uh, environmental uh, rules. And this is to avoid in the future. And yeah, but the question I can't answer. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, now the last question, which uh, is as expected about money. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Manika will uh, give us the answer whether uh, a sort of civic ship owner can have access to European investment bank funds and uh, under which conditions. Uh, as said before, indeed, this is the case. Uh, short C ship owner can have access to EIB loan. We're talking about minimum 50 million project for a 7.5 million loan. This can be for a construction of a new building or a retrofit. Um, uh, and uh, other than that, I think that it's, uh, it gives me the opportunity to highlight a couple of other issues here. Uh, the first one being that uh, European Investment Bank is still a bank, it's still a lender as every lender we're looking to get our money back, which means that we're looking for solid balance sheets, uh, meaningful business plan, uh, solid cash flow, uh, strong asset base, so that we are able to lend. Um, eligibility the criteria we have touched on before, so projects of, of European interest are, are important. And finally, also to mention that uh, we are strict also on tax compliance. So this is something to underline as well. If all these things exist, then definitely a SIP owner can have access to any AAB loan. They can come to us, we can discuss further. When it comes to terms and conditions, these are on a case-by-case -case basis, so we have to examine them uh, differently for each case. Thank you, Mr. Manika. And uh, I believe now we have uh, arrived to the end of this uh, session. I would like to thank all uh, the speakers for the excellent presentations. And uh, I would like to thank all of you for your participation, not only in the interactive discussions, but uh, through the presentations and the discussions and the answers given by uh, the speakers. Thank you very much. So, we, we thank you very, very much.
I thanks of all for all the contents, for all the presentations, and for respecting the time. We know it's very, very important what you have to say. So a big thanks and a big applause, first of all, from our panel speakers. Dr. Abe Youssef, thank you very much for being with us. Mrs. Maria Zumanika, thank you very, very much for the information. Mr. Marco Nolke, welcome, thank you very, very much. Professor Maria Lekaku, thank you very much. Mr. Vasily Drogothetis from Lake Summer Pacific, thank you very much. Mr. Larry Ketzgeski, our keynote speaker, thank you very much. And last but not least, our moderator, Dr. Ioannis Natokas, thank you very much.